My name is Firuz Yahidi, and um, I became friends with Elizabeth Taylor about 35 years ago. It was a wonderful beginning. It was like as if someone had written a script, um, the introduction, the way it went. And um, I met her through my cousin who was dating her, and then he asked me to look after her. And one thing led to another. This was back in Washington, D.C., where I was a student at the Corcoran School of Art. Prior to that, I'd been a diplomat working for the Iranian government, the previous Iranian government, not this one. And um, so I, I always wanted to be an artist, and I'd sort of started doing photography and became keen on photography, but wasn't sure if that was something I would succeed at. And I wasn't really getting encouragement from my family uh, because, you know, becoming an artist to them was an alien sub uh, subject. So um, they sort of filled me with a lot of insecurities. You know, they, uh, they made me feel like I would never succeed, I would never make any money. And when I met Elizabeth and I told her about, you know, my background, and she encouraged me to do exactly what I wanted to do and went on to support me and get me work and take me with her, sell, uh, with her to Hollywood. Um, so we became closer and closer and closer and until she died, I mean the day she died, I was photographing her house for Architectural Digest. And it was a very sort of sad day in fact because I, um, you know, I had to finish the job whilst I knew that she had just passed away. But it was a full cycle of you know knowing her for 35 years until the very end. We met at the embassy. My cousin invited her to come. My cousin was the ambassador from Iran at that point. He invited her to come and stay at the embassy. And then he said to me, I was having dinner with him when he made this arrangement, and he said, I want you to come and help look after Elizabeth Taylor with me. And I was 26 years old. I was about to have my finals at um, the Corcoran School of Art. And I had to make a decision. Do I pay attention to my finals or do I look after Elizabeth Taylor? And I made the decision to spend my time with Elizabeth Taylor. So we put together a brunch for her at the embassy and a small group of people were invited and we all were all anticipating you know, Elizabeth Taylor, the movie star, to arrive. It was a pleasantly warm and sunny day with blossoming trees creating the perfect backdrop for the occasion. I'd supervised the staff and helped select the menu. Several round tables covered in crisp white linen were set with, set with fine china and silverware. Servers glided about with trays of drinks and crystal glasses. When the doorbell finally rang, the butler ran down, put down his tray and rushed to the front door, followed closely by my cousin who wanted to personally greet his famous house guest. Those of us gathered on the terrace lowered our voices and all eyes turned towards the French doors leading out to the terrace in anticipation of getting our first glimpse of Liz. Elizabeth, a few inches above five feet tall, walked out into the sunlight wearing faded bell-bottom jeans and a floral t-shirt with her little feet tucked into a pair of well-worn canvas espadrilles. Admittedly, like most of the guests, I was expecting a more dramatic movie star entrance. Regardless, we were all captivated by what seemed to be a special aura that surrounded her. Led by my cousin, she made her way from one guest to the next and introduced herself with a pleasant and slightly shy smile affixed on her face. The understated attire was soon forgotten as each time she shook someone's hand, her 33 carat crop diamond sparkled so brightly that one almost had to squint. When Elizabeth sat down in the shade and removed the sunglasses, Every guest seemed to turn at once to see the color of her eyes, which had been described as violet blue, framed with double thick black lashes. To this day, I can't be sure of their exact color, but what I can be sure of was the way Elizabeth looked at you. It was a look that made you feel that at that particular moment, you were the only person on earth she was interested in. 
I couldn't get over the fact that she was so completely opposite to what I'd expected. She was down to earth, charming and approachable. We got to know each other really well and within 24 hours or so we became great friends. I think we both saw something in each other. I mean, she, was, she had just um, separated for the second time from Richard Burton and was going through a tough time. And I was feeling kind of insecure about my future. You know, once I graduate, what's going to happen? Will I get work as a photographer or not? I guess the bonding came about because of that. But, um, you know, it was just maybe more than that. I don't know what it was, but, you know, sometimes a friendship develops between two people and there's no, um, you know, black and white answer to it. Anyway, so my cousin asked her to go to Iran on a goodwill trip. And she said to him she would go if I was sent along with her uh, as her guide, you know, companion, and he agreed to that. And so we went off to Iran. There's me. <laughs> uh, everyone says I look like Borat there. Um, but I'm glad I don't anymore. I like the white hair more. Um, so we, we went all around Iran, we went to all the sites, Persopolis, Shiraz, Isfahan, Tehran, and uh, she shopped in the bazaars, she, she bought all these fabrics and costumes and um, really had a great time um, visiting the sites. And, but we were like tourists, you know, I had a camera, she had a camera, we just took photos of each other. There was no intention of ever publishing any of these photos. It was just like two friends taking photos of each other. And um, so this is when uh, she liked to put on her own makeup for hours and hours and hours. Um, this was when we were staying at the Shah Abbas Hotel. It's no longer a Shah. There's no longer a Shah attached to it, but it's still there. And in fact, my wife, Beth, who's here somewhere, she went to Iran this last year and stayed at that same hotel in the same suite. So she could have her photo taken and sent to me. Um, we went to the mosque, and as you can see here, um, you know, her eyes really do give her away, although nobody there uh, knew who she was. But the, the, the funny thing about this is in those days, back in 1976, both men and women could go into the same mosque. Uh, you didn't have the problems you have now with, with all the strict rules that the Islamic uh, Republic has set up. And this is at uh, Persopolis, um, where again, you can see, you know, she's attired in her hippie outfit, very casual. No movie star stuff about her, her hair isn't really done. But uh, she was having a great time. And uh, there she is taking photo herself. Um, and that's Arthur Brukel, her hairdresser, who was on the trip with us taking a photo of her. Um, okay, so now that we're here, I gotta read you another little story. And uh, it includes a friend of mine who is here, who lives in Fort Lauderdale. His name is Amir, and he was in Iran at that point. So the next day, my friend Amir was going to take us on a tour to see the crown jewels at the Central Bank of Iran. Elizabeth had been looking forward to this outing from the start. Amir and I were waiting for her in the lobby, and as we were chatting, I noticed his eyes wander off towards the stairway, at which point a, bewil a bewildered look appeared on his face. Turned to see Elizabeth descending, followed by Arthur, her hairdresser, who was looking extremely proud of himself. He'd taken one of the cotton fabrics Elizabeth had purchased at the bazaar and had wrapped it turban-like around her head. I ran over and whispered to her, please take it off. But why? I think it's beautiful, she protested. Elizabeth, please trust me, it's not a scarf. You're wearing a tablecloth on your head. People here will think you're nuts. Still protesting, she obliged, returned to her room, and reappeared a few minutes later, sans turban. And we set off for the central bank. Upon entering the vault, we were awestruck by the vast quantity of unset precious gems, 
jewel-encrusted thrones, crowns, tiaras, swords, shields, and countless sparkling stones piled up on plates. It was a vast, dark, quiet room filled with security guards and the only lighting coming from the spotlights focused on the magnificent jewels. At one point, a captivated Elizabeth turned her ring around on her finger and whispered to Amir that she felt embarrassed by the size of the crop diamond, which looked like a grain of sand next to the mounds of diamonds displayed in trays around the room. Back at the hotel, inspired by all that she had seen, Elizabeth asked that I take some photos of her in the outfits she'd purchased at the bazaar. In order to do justice to the colorful costumes, Arthur and I decided to alter the background in the living room of her suite. We rummaged through the shopping bags and decided to tape up a bunch of silk scarves on the wall, then draped a vault of sequined fabrics over the sofa. I went to my room to load up my camera with a roll of film. But before returning to her suite, I paused to think. Up to that point, there had been no pressure on me as I was simply taking casual snapshots of Elizabeth. Having her get dressed up and pose on a set carried with it a far more professional responsibility. This was not going to be like a minor portrait I'd done for Andy Warhol's interview magazine. All of a sudden, I was having a panic attack. What if I did a lousy job? Not that she'd be upset, but it would show that I was not good enough to become a professional portrait photographer. And her approval was very important to me. But it was too late to change course now. Trying to think of a way to calm down and not look pathetic, I remembered that a friend had given me a joint at a party a few nights prior, which I had slipped into my pocket. I went through my clothes, found the joint, and without thinking twice, fired it up and took a few puffs. I waited a minute or two, and when the herb took effect, I finally began to relax. I went back to Elizabeth's suite and waited for her, ready for the challenge. After a while, Elizabeth emerged from the bedroom, dressed in a sparkly tribal costume, accessorized by a headdress created by Arthur from one of the scarves. Dangling from her forehead was the famous Taj Mahal diamond, Let's see, there it is, a, um, a gift from Richard Burton. Pleasantly stoned, I started having a Technicolor Hollywood of the 50s Arabian Nights moment, reminiscent of the movies I'd seen as a kid in Iran. Elizabeth stretched out on the sofa, adjusted her pose, and looked into my lens. Once again, she was camera ready. Her presentation, enhanced by the costume and the diamond, didn't warrant any direction from me. And so without saying a word, I looked through the eyepiece and began snapping away. She changed her pose slightly each time she heard a few clicks of the shutter. Without saying a word, I kept pressing that button and looking through my lens at this extraordinarily beautiful woman who had in the past sat for the likes of Richard Avedon, Bert Stern and Cecil Beaton. Here she was, without any fuss, giving me one of the most memorable moments of my life. There she is. Um, anyway, we had this amazing trip, and uh, we came back, and the, the relationship between her and my cousin didn't really last. But uh, I was fortunate in that she and John Warner had struck up a relationship. They fell in love, and um, she moved to Washington and married John. Um, so she moved to Washington. I was very happy about that because that's where I was living. And we, we, our friendship just got you know, stronger and stronger every day. I would hang out with her. I'd go watch old movies. She'd tell me about old Hollywood and who did what to whom, etc. And then... Um, but I wasn't having much of a success as a photographer. I wasn't making much money. And it got to the point that with pressure from my family that I got to get a real job, I thought of maybe going back to the diplomatic service or anything just to make some money. So um, I decided to go back to Iran. 
But um, so I went to see her and to tell her this. And she said, don't go back yet. I'm making a movie in Hollywood. You can come as my photographer and make some money and take some time and think about things. And she picked up the phone, called up the producer, and made the deal herself for me to go to Hollywood with her. So in 1978, in the summer of 1978, I left Washington and went to Hollywood with Elizabeth Taylor. And um, then I met a lady that I fell in love with. And um, with Elizabeth's encouragement, I married um, this young lady. And we had a son. And it's a good thing I didn't go back to Iran. The stories are in the book. If you get the book, you'll read them. Um, because um, soon after I got married, two months after I got married in s late 78, uh, the regime in Iran fell and the Islamic Republic took over. So if I'd gone back, I would have been in a lot of trouble. I, one of the things that I did, this is the first time I'd been on a film set. She was in Vienna and um, doing a film called A Little Night Music. And this is before actually we went to Hollywood. And um, she invited me to come along. And this was the first time I'd been on a film set. It was very exciting to see this magnificent film set and people in costumes and seeing directors and costume people and makeup people and grips and people moving things around. It was just like a fantasy for me to be on a film set. And I took a bunch of photos of her, this being one of them, um, that is one of my favorites from back in 1976. And that summer, we went back, we, when we came back to the States, I got her to become friends with Warhol. She had a th thing, she wasn't crazy about Andy, there's a big story about it in the book, you can read. <laughs> and, but I got them to become friendly and he invited her to go up to his compound in Montauk. And there we were. Uh, he couldn't come because he had to go to Europe to do some portraits and make lots of money. And so she and I and some friends were there. And as you can see, she was just like one of the gang. I mean, she, I know she had this um, image or the image that's been projected of her, of the, man, the woman with the jewelry and the husbands and the glamour and all that. But really, she was very down to earth. And the reason I'm do I did this book, at first I was just going to do a book of photographs. But when she passed away and I was reading all these obituaries by these tabloids and newspapers about you know, the many time married Elizabeth Taylor with all the jewelry, blah, blah, blah. It really got me ticked off, and I said, you know what, there's this other side to her people have to know about. And so I added the stories that go along with the photographs in the book. Um, because, you know, all these wonderful things happened. All these, I had all these great experiences with her, uh, uh, doing things that normal people do, that she did, that, you know, I guess people didn't think she did. It's like when people say, you know, does the Queen of England go to the bathroom? Yes, she does, you know. She did regular things too. Um, so this was her having fun playing softball in Montauk. And uh, this was her cooking, well, or cooking once. <laughs> um, this was on the farm, John Warner's farm. And uh, we would go there uh, some weekends and she would be in her nighty in a dressing gown. Uh, and um, be making fried chicken, which was one of her f favorite dishes. And um, we would sit around and she would entertain us. There was always some game we would play, like charades or something like that. But uh, that's her stepdaughter, who one of the things I learned from Elizabeth was that, you know, she remained friends with everybody. Um, this was Richard Burton's daughter, Kate Burton, great actress. And at that point, you know, she was sort of newly divorced from Richard, but she was very close to her stepchildren as well. And I, years later, she became very close with Carrie Fisher. And I'm sure you're all aware of the Eddie Fisher saga. Um, but, you know, Elizabeth was just warm, uh, compassionate, loving, and, you know, you couldn't help but adore her. 
And this is her driving us around uh, in the pickup truck on the farm. That's her daughter, Liza. And this is when we went to Los Angeles for the movie she was making, which was called Return Engagement. Um, I think Bonnie got it right wrong earlier when she said it was Little Night Music. But anyway, this was a TV movie she did in the um, summer of 78. This is the one she got me the job on. She basically took the part, it was a little movie for television, but she took the part because she was already fed up in Washington. It wasn't her place. She wasn't happy there. And it was the time when she was eating too much, drinking too much, doing all the stuff she shouldn't be doing. That's, and she wasn't looking good. So she needed to get out of there, and we, we went there to L.A. I had a great time. Six weeks at the Beverly Hills Hotel for me at that point was being like in heaven, um, especially with Elizabeth. A few years later, I, I always landed up taking photos of her, putting on makeup. Uh, this was backstage when she was doing Little Foxes in, in, on Broadway. Um, this was, um, you know, she would help get me jobs. This was in the beginning of, so, you know, I'd just gotten married. We had a kid. I wasn't making much money. So she would, you know, get me jobs now and again. And this was one of the jobs she got me to work with her um, of her magazines. Um, she decided to leave John. She came to L.A. She got divorced. She went to rehab. She lost weight. She got to look beautiful all over again. Um, this was in the mid 80s. Um, and uh, she's wearing her Legion of Honor medal there, given to her by the French government. And uh, this is what she looked like after you know all the problems she'd had in, in Washington once she cleaned up her bad habits. Um, and then, you know, the movie roles were not really coming her way, and she really wasn't that interested in, in films anymore. I mean, she'd won all these Oscars making these brilliant films. And for a middle-aged actress back then, this is the 80s, uh, there really wasn't many roles. And, it, you know, today you have a lot of TV, uh, and a lot of actresses and actors move on to TV because they do great stuff on TV. But back then, you know, you had Hallmark Hall of Fame movie of the month, you know, that's what you would land up getting. Um, so she decided to heck with it. She would do a little movie or a little bit here and a little bit there, but she started a fantastic perfume business and she made millions and millions of dollars out of it. And this is her holding a couple of her bottles uh, of uh, her perfume there. I did this as an editorial for a magazine called Premiere. And the day I was doing this, was one of the reasons I, I chose to do this shoot was I had talked Vanity Fair into doing a cover story on her. And they had come back and said, we would do it if she will hold up a condom in her hand. Now, the reason for that being that in the mid-80s, she lost one of her best friends, Rock Hudson, to AIDS. And I can see a few faces here who are over 20 years old. And so back in the 80s, the whole issue of AIDS was you know, very scary, very dramatic. People treated it like a major plague. Nobody wanted to go near anybody with AIDS. I mean, it was rough times for people who, who, who were suffering from that disease. She was the first major celebrity to stand up and say something about that. To stand up, she made Reagan say the word AIDS. She stood up in front of the Senate, in front of the UN. She talked to pharmaceutical companies. She got all the drugs that were, well, she helped get the drugs that were needed to, to, to help with the, the issue of AIDS. And she wasn't scared of losing her reputation. I mean, this is, these days, right now, it's very trendy for celebrities to stand up and have a cause like Haiti or the environment or whatever, which is great. But everybody else is behind those. At the time she stood up and uh, talked about AIDS, um, you know, you could have lost your uh, reputation um, because nobody else was doing that. Not only was she talking about it, but she was holding people, hugging people, treating them, you know, these people who, who had gotten AIDS, she, she treated them with compassion. And so anyway, 
I talked Vanity Fair into doing cover, and they wanted her to do the cover holding a condom, which was sort of embarrassing for me because I thought, are they trying to make fun of her, or um, is this going to be humiliating or silly? And for me, it was embarrassing. I mean, people weren't really talking condoms at that point, you know. I mean, um, so I approached through her publicist because I didn't want to ask her directly. You know, she was like family to me, and you know, as I sort of said before, it was like going to your mother and saying, can you hold a condom? Um, so I talked to her publicist and she came back and said, Elizabeth said it's fine. So there she is, holding a condom. Uh, but, so this was a test shoot I did for not knowing how I was going to do the cover for the magazine. And it was kind of awkward because I was feeling very awkward. She, she didn't care. I mean, she was having fun with it. Um, and. The, so, but I sent this image to the art director at Vanity Fair, and then he came back with some instructions of, you know, let's do it uh, with in a different setup and don't hold it up there. So this landed up being the cover of um, Vanity Fair. Uh, very stylish, very, um, you know, beautiful, elegant, and the whole purpose was to to encourage people to have safe sex. And um, it was a successful cover for them, and it was a successful message for everybody else. And I'm very proud of this. And at that point, in fact, um, you know, the image being so controversial, I had a lot of other magazines coming to me to buy the image from me to use in their magazines. And I said to Elizabeth, I am going to offer it to three top publications and I'm talking 1992, so that's you know many years ago. I said, I'm going to ask each of them for twenty-five thousand dollars, and you're going to get all of that money for your AIDS foundation. Sure enough, I got three major publications overseas who offered the money, so I gave her a check for seventy-five thousand um, dollars. Thank you, um, because I thought it was just you know she had so much courage. You know, she wasn't, she didn't have fear. And that's what, one of the things she taught me was not to be afraid and not to be, you know, worried about, you know, taking a step in a direction I wanted to take. And if I was going to fail, I should stand up and go, go again and, you know, try and, try and succeed at what I was doing. She had no fears and, and bless her. I mean, you know, she, she was a major force there. And this was when we went to Amsterdam. Uh, she, she, she went all over the place, you know, talking about AIDS. This was at an AIDS conference back in 92. Um, and she had lost several people close to her to AIDS. So, you know, she was very passionate about it. Um, and when we took time off, she could have a good laugh. Um, this was in the south of France when we went for Cinema Against AIDS and she with Amphar. This is just prior to her starting her own AIDS foundation and she was a spokesperson for Amphar. And, you know, she could relax and have fun and wear silly hats um, and look beautiful, you know, taking a rest on the back of a yacht with her dog Sugar who looks like she's about to fly off. Um, and um, this is a portrait I took off her. Actually, I zoomed in on this. I did a shoot uh, for the cover of French Vogue with her. And I've always loved this image in a selfish way because I can see myself in her pupils. So it's my self-portrait through Elizabeth Taylor. And this image actually is a limited edition image that has sold quite well. And uh, I sold one of them at one of the fundraisers for her foundation, and it raised a lot of money. Um, so this, in the book, you'll see lots of um, at-home photos. This is her again with sugar at home in Bel Air. And um, so, you know, and this is her with her Oscars. This was actually shot for a magazine, but, uh, um, you know, the, the, I mean, one of the things that's very interesting about her, and you compare her to actresses who started young today, I mean, child actresses. You know, she started as a child actress when she was very young, with a very pushy stage mother. And um, she, she was always in front of a camera. And she wanted to rebel and not be an actress when she was in her late teens, but her mother pushed her to stay in films. And she, and she was 18 when she did A Place in the Sun. 
And I think it was just a couple of years later that she was in Giant. Um, she was maybe in her early 20s. And the funny thing is the the actors playing her children, where some of them were older than her, like Dennis Hopper and Carol Baker. Um, but, you know, she did a great job in that film. She was pretty much like a feminist in that film, you know. She, she took great roles early on in her career. And, you know, until I think uh, the last major role she did that everybody loved was Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. But, the, you know, in the 70s, actresses in their 40s were not really getting anything substantial in roles. You know, they had to be somebody's mother or grandmother or a lawyer. And these days, you know, you have people like Meryl Streep in their mid to late 60s who are still superstars. Diane Keaton, you know, a whole bunch of them. Charlotte Rampling just got nominated for an Oscar. She's in her 70s. Um, but in those days, you know, it was tough for, for good roles, for actresses. But regardless, she won all of these Oscars. And she went through all those scandals, and uh, she she pulled through it all, and she became a successful business person, and also the major spokesperson for AIDS. And you compare her to I'm going to name them, you know, like the Lindsay Lohans of today, who started. I, I photographed Lindsay Lohan when she was very young on uh, Parent Trap. She was this cute little kid, and I thought, what a cute little kid. And I'm thinking these days, what a nightmare, you know. I mean, she's grown up with all these problems. Every time you pick up the tabloid, you know, she's done something awful. Some of them just don't get over it, and they're very self-centered. But Elizabeth was totally different. I mean, she, she wasn't self-centered. She saw a purpose in her life beyond herself. Um, she, she found a cause, and um, to the very end, she, she um, strove to, you know, um, do her best in, in getting funds and, you know, setting up the, her AIDS Foundation. And to this day, we're raising money for her AIDS Foundation and my proceeds from the book go to her AIDS Foundation. So that is why, you know, she's so admirable. Um, this is her having fun at home with her good friend Roddy McDowell, who uh, was a child actor alongside her since, you know, they were, I don't know how young. Um, I think there was a movie they were in together, what was it? Lassie, something like that. Um, anyway, so this was at home in Bel Air, and uh, he was having fun, and she was like putting on a, like a Persian look for her, actually. Um, and this, this is one of my favorite photos of her, because I always used to... Uh, make fun of her hairdos, which she used to like pile up to here. And this was after her brain surgery. She had a little uh, tumor removed, and sh they shaved off her hair. And uh, as you can see, when the focus is just on the face and those eyes, with minimum makeup, I mean, she looks absolutely beautiful. And she was in her uh, mid-60s at that point. Um, just absolutely stunning. And so I got to be her escort. She asked me to go to the White House for the Millennium Dinner with her. And I thought I was going to be seated with her, and she thought I was going to be seated with her. But this greedy fellow, um, <laughs> who you can see in that photo, um, decided he wanted to be surrounded by the world's most beautiful women. So I was like, led to another table, and she sat with him and Sophia Loren. Um, so, and this is her again at home, having fun, you know, dressed casually, dancing for my camera. Um, and uh, we had so many good times uh, at her house. Every Sunday she would do a brunch and invite all sorts of people, not just celebrities, maybe there'd be two or three celebrities, but it'd be the, it would be family, friends, children, grandchildren. She even had great-grandchildren. Um, they'd be running through the rooms, jumping in the pool. It was like being in a suburban house. So this was shot for Vanity Fair for the Hollywood issue. I was approached by the curator of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Uh, and she asked me if I had, um, she was the curator of Islamic art. Um, she said, do you have photographs of Iran prior to the revolution? And I had left Iran when I was a kid. And I'd only gone back three times. And the last time was in 1976 with Elizabeth. I said, you know what? 
I don't think I have what you want, but I have some photos of Elizabeth Taylor in Iran. She said, send them to me. So I sent her the photos, and it wasn't just Elizabeth. It was also, you know, we were in the bazaar and all over the place, so I took some other additional photos. And um, she said, wow, we like these. We want to do a show with these. So I was thrilled to get a museum show. You know, I mean, how many people get a museum show? And that with photographs of Elizabeth. And at this point, you know, Elizabeth was 78 years old. She wasn't doing well. She had a lot of health issues. And I called her up, very excited, and told her about this. And she said, great. And I said, will you come to the opening? She said, sure. Uh, unfortunately, by the time the show went up, she was in, hosp in the hospital. And um, that was in February uh, 2011. And I had asked them to do start the show on her birthday. I wanted it to be a birthday present to her on the 27th of uh, February. But she was in the hospital, she couldn't make it, and sadly, uh, less than a month later, she died. So she never got to see the show, but I felt like this was my tribute, and thank you to her for, um, for you know, this journey that I took with her, not just to Iran, but throughout 35 years of my life. Um, and actually, just when she was in the hospital, Architectural Digest asked me to photograph her home. This is her home, and as you can see, it's not a movie star home. It's just a simple ranch-style house in the hills of, uh, of Bel Air. Um, it used to belong to Nancy Sinatra at some point, and some person bought it and, you know, did a little bit of work to it. And, you know, it's nice, but it's simple, you know. And um, so the day I started shooting, um, her assistant had told me that, you know, Elizabeth would, we had rearranged the bedroom downstairs. There was a second floor where Elizabeth's suite was, you know, her bedroom, her dressing room, and bathroom, and all that. Um, and because she couldn't really walk up and down anymore, we decided to turn a bedroom downstairs into our bedroom. So we brought down all her favorite stuff. And uh, this is the living room, by the way. Um, she had great art, by the way. You know, her father had been an art dealer and he had a gallery at the Beverly Hills Hotel, I believe. Um, and um, so with his advice, he'd, she'd collected some great art. The sculptures on the right side, the horses, are by her daughter, Eliza, who's a brilliant artist. And um, there's a little war hall and a hockney there. And then you have a, quite a good selection of Impressionist art and 20th century, early 20th century art, um, but all, you know, cluttered together, um, and all were sold at uh, Christie's. Um, so anyway, I was, um, we rearranged everything, and we created her bedroom downstairs, and I was photographing upstairs, they hadn't moved her dressing room downstairs yet, I was photographing her dressing room upstairs, and as I was doing this photograph, her publicist came in and said, Farouz, you have to stop now. And I thought, great, Elizabeth's coming back home, because they kept saying she's going to come back home any day, and I thought, you know, they didn't want a crew of photographer and assistants and editors, etc. there, so I was very happy. I thought she was coming back home. I said, oh, she's coming back home, and the publicist said, no, she's dying. On, you know, she's really dying. And it was like so shocking and so upsetting for me. And so I packed up all my stuff and we left. And, um, and sure enough, like two in the morning, the next day she died. And it, it was a very sad, sad, sad day for me. Um, this was the bedroom we created downstairs. Um, and um, with, you know, some of her favorite collections and photographs of her family. And the painting on the right is something she did as a teenager herself. And um, the f black and white photographs over there, uh, her father and mother when they were younger. So when she took me to LA with her, um, and we were staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel, she made sure that Edith Head, who was like one of the most famous costume designers in Hollywood, she'd won Oscars uh, for various films, 
and she was great friends with Elizabeth, she made sure that Edith did the costumes for the movie. And then Edith invited Elizabeth to come stay at her uh, house, this beautiful house, um, over the weekend whilst we took a break from the film. <laughs> So, if you have questions, or very few, I think we're sort of out of time, but a few questions. Yes. Of all of your wonderful personal accounts, I was just curious if there was any one particular moment when you first fell in love with her. One I fell in love with her repeatedly. Um, no, I mean, when I say I fell in love with it wasn't a, you know, it was like family love. It was like your mom. It was like, you know, she was just so nice and so good that I just um, had this continuous, you know, love for her. You know, respect, love, admiration. Yes. No, she had two sons and two daughters, one of them her own, and one was adopted. She was a great mother. I mean, early on, you know, when she had the boys and Eliza, I mean, she had two sons by Michael Wilding Sr. when she was in her early 20s, and she had Liza Todd from Mike Todd a little later on, a few years after that. And, um, you know, she was working all the time, and then Mike Todd died, and you know, he left her in debt, believe it or not, so she had to work. And so the kids had nannies, they had to be looked after, and you have to understand, Elizabeth was in her 20s at that point, um, and she wasn't a housewife. It wasn't like, you know, she had all the time in the world to look after the kids. So in the beginning, she had help. And her son, Christopher, who's a good friend of mine, he's, um, you know, I've known him forever, and I adore him. I said to him, you know, if I talk about you, uh, your mother, and you guys, you know, what can I say about those years when she wasn't around? And he said, you know, the best thing was that when she wasn't around, she made sure we were with great people to look after us. So when I got to know Elizabeth, I mean, her kids were always around her, and I became great friends with all of them. And she was a great mom at that point. I mean, she was spending a lot of time with the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And she really looked after them, you know, in many, in many ways. After Mike Todd died, and uh, she was filming Butterfield 8 when he died, and she had to go finish the film, you know, uh, when, this, when this tragedy happened. But she got an Oscar for the film, despite the fact that um, she later married Eddie Fisher and that whole scandal with Eddie and Debbie and blah, blah, blah. Um, by the way, he was not the best husband, and even Debbie Reynolds has said that, and he wasn't the best father. So at that point, it was scandalous that she went off with Eddie Fisher. But, so she told me the story that she was in New York with Eddie Fisher at the hotel, exhausted, um, and uh, you know they were promoting the film, um, Butterfield Date, and so she was in the tub, taking a bath, late at night, and the phone rings, and she tells Eddie to pick it up in the other room. And he picks it up and comes up to her and says, it's for you, and talks, and they want you to play Cleopatra. And she says, oh, you know, nah, nah, I don't want to do that. And he goes back and speaks to the people at Fox and comes back and forth. And she finally shouts at the top of her lungs, so that they can hear on the phone at the other end. She says, tell them I'll do it if they'll give me a million dollars. So after a little bit, Eddie, Eddie Fisher comes back and says, they'll give you a million dollars. <laughs> and that was the first time an actor or an actress got a million dollars for a movie. And that was 1959, 1960. So she started a whole trend. Thank you. Okay. So she was great friends with Michael Jackson. Did she ever tell you any stories or what she really thought of Michael Jackson? You know, one of the reasons I had a great friendship with Elizabeth was because I never asked her anything like that. Like, 
why this, why that, you know, what do you think of this person, what do you think? If she volunteered information to me, I take it, but I'm not into gossip and all that sort of stuff. Um, things go into one ear and out the other ear. Please, you know, you can ask my wife. I can, I can't remember a thing. Um, but <laughs> I, she didn't say. I mean, she would say things about Michael, but I didn't really pay attention to 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 that relationship. I know she cared for him because he had gone through a similar childhood as hers. You know that she, he had to work as a kid. I never had the proper childhood, like the way, you know, like she didn't have a proper childhood. Um, always having to work and having pressure from a parent, you know, to work and not getting the kind of schooling that would have been appropriate. So, but I, you know, I, I met him a few times with her, but, um, and as much as I liked his music, I, I wasn't that intrigued by him as a person to, to he had too much makeup on. <laughs> I, I didn't ask questions about him. Sorry if I can't give you any more info than that. Well, well, well thank you so much, Ruth. And I know there's a lot more questions. <laughs> okay. This photograph. It's very unique. I don't think you're going to get any other uh, celebrities or movie stars wearing that attire. That's the traditional attire that women have to wear, especially if they go to the mosque. Um, it's called a chador, and she was having fun, uh, you know, playing this role. And in the background, you have a man going in from that side and a tribal woman with her baby going in from this side. And I don't think that is allowed anymore. Uh, because, you know, they've sort of separated men and women. And even when she wasn't wearing the chador, not too many people recognized her. Uh, you know, you have to understand we were in parts of Iran that a lot of people hadn't seen movies or were not aware of movie stars and, you know, that sort of culture. In the summer of 1976, uh, I accompanied Elizabeth Taylor to Iran. It was a trip that was organized by Iran Air, and they had requested my, from my cousin, who was the ambassador from Iran to Washington, D.C., to um, pull a group of people together. Uh, at that point, he was um, uh, having um, a relationship <laughs> with uh, Elizabeth Taylor, and I had become friends with her. That was a fun day. She was taking pictures, I took pictures of her taking pictures. She, she I think, took pictures of me taking pictures. <laughs> um, you know, we were just snapping like tourists do. When I met her, I just was in the last few weeks of uh, graduating from art school. I had been a diplomat because my family was in the diplomatic services and in the government in Iran, and I really didn't want to be a part of that. I really wanted to be an artist. One day we visited um, this tea house in Shiraz, which was in an old, um, I don't know what the building originally was, but it had been turned into a tea house to, um, to attract tourists. This photograph for me is very special because it, you know, I, I, I left Iran when I was very young, so uh, I don't have a lot of memories, but I, what the memories I do have are the sounds and some of the sights. And this, to me, symbolizes the sort of lazy summer afternoons when you retreated inside a cool place where there was the water and the fountain trickling and uh, you could only hear afar the sound of people in the street or the donkeys or the carriages going by. Um, so there was sort of peaceful and harmonious inside. This is the main bazaar in Isfahan. Um, it's huge, very big. And as you can see, all the tribes, all the tribal people are there with their goods, selling them. A lot of beautiful fabrics, um, costumes, outfits. And we went there. We went to several bazaars, but this was the best one. And what was fun was we were at lunchtime when we went 
this man had sort of closed shop and he was sleeping on top of his um, counter. She had bought some uh, tribal costumes at the bazaar and she said, oh, you know what, I want to try these on and I want you to take some photographs of me. Um, so I went to my room, got my camera, I came back, she was all dressed up, made up. She and I spread all these fabrics from the bazaar over the furniture and the walls, so it made it look like a tent, interior of a tent. And uh, she laid down and looked into my camera and I just took the photographs. This image actually I've blown up. The full image is three quarters of her body is showing. But I just sort of zoomed in on the face and because she just looks so beautiful there and framed by this sort of exotic outfit and that gigantic diamond. <laughs> um, it's one of the most beautiful photographs I've taken of her and I've taken a lot of pictures of her. I've photographs of her cover Vanity Fair and French Vogue and everything but this is my favorite because I did it uh, without knowing that one day it'll end up being published or printed or hang on a wall somewhere in a museum and it was just a very personal moment Well, interesting because that brings me, and we're going to show a few pictures of, of some of your iconic work and some of the great stars who you, who you photograph. So we'll, we'll put those up as we chat. But the book is called Look at Me. And I want you to tell me why you chose that title. Um, for three reasons. The first reason is as a photographer, when you direct someone to at a sitting, you give them directions as to whether they should look to the left, to the right. And then you say, look at me. So you have eye contact. Um, a second reason is when you're working with celebrities and shooting them for magazines or for an advertising campaign, they're doing that in order to promote a film, a music album, or a TV show, whatever. So they want you to look at them too. So they're saying, look at me. The third reason being my very personal, that like, look at me, I made it, you know? I had no idea I would get to this point in my life, but I did. Uh, somehow I managed to get here. Lucky me, you know, just look at me. <laughs> well, I think that's, it's really, it's really interesting that. And, and, you know, you almost are a throwback to a bygone era. I mean, I'm not saying that as if you're a dinosaur, but you know, you worked with a camera and film and when magazines were jam packed with, you know, they were thick, the glossy magazines. Vanity Fair, Vogue, you know, all the other Hollywood magazines. You had all these amazing um, jobs, so to speak. What is the situation like now for that kind of work? Well, it's totally changed since the internet came in uh, to the picture, um, so to speak. Um, you know, I, I lived through the golden age of photography for magazines, you know, 80s, 90s, the early 2000s. Um, there was a big budget, you know, magazines had a lot of advertising, so they could uh, splurge on getting good photographers, good hair and makeup people, fly people around the world to do stuff. But they don't have that budget anymore because everybody's shifted to the internet with, for advertising purposes. Nobody buys magazines anymore. And if you look at them, they're very skimpy, maximum 100 pages maybe. I'm primarily talking about magazines to do with style, uh, fashion magazines, uh, or magazines like Vanity Fair. They really don't have that readership. Nobody goes to a newsstand anymore and stands there looking through magazines and buying one. Everyone just clicks on the computer and goes on the internet. And most of the magazines have switched to uh, having you know, an online magazine. So things have shifted and I'm so happy I lived through that phase and, uh, and enjoyed it and you know, profited from it, not just financially, but you know, what it was was just a unique era to go through. 